Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to our service. Whether you're in the building here or listening in, you're very welcome indeed, and we hope that together we will have a sense of the Lord's presence and be able to worship him in a way that's pleasing to him and beneficial to us as well. We're going to begin our service by singing together using the words of the Lord eternal reigns. One of the great benefits of being up here, and there aren't too many in my opinion, um, is that you can choose hymns that you uh, really like. And so this is, this is one of those resounding hymns with great words. Let's stand together and sing. come together in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that we can sing with confidence, knowing that indeed the Lord eternal reigns, knowing that his throne is built on high, knowing that he is the one, as we read this morning in the psalm, who controls the the sea, who controls the natural world around us, that natural world which points so strongly and vividly to you, and yet Uh, is ignored or or bypassed in terms of its message to those who enjoy it and benefit from it, which all of us do. And our Father, we thank you that uh, as we look at those questions, will he write his name, my my master and my friend? The answer, obviously, that would come is, no, of course he couldn't. Why could he? How could a great God, a perfect God, a holy God, a God who can't look on sin, can't tolerate sin, who must punish sin. How could such a God look on me and decide that I should be his friend? It's impossible. And yet, our Father, you used the machinations, the evil plans and, and designs of humankind uh, as they sent the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross, as they spurned the Messiah that the Jews themselves waited for for so long, and they wanted rid of him. They said, away with him, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. Our Father, we have to admit that is our natural reaction as well. We prefer to be our own God. We prefer to go our own way. We we don't want anyone to reign over us. 
and yet you have brought so many of us here to the point where we recognize that we are sinners, that we are not capable of running our own lives, that if we do so, it will end in disaster, it will end in hell itself. And yet, our Father, you have loved us, you have sent the Lord Jesus, you have used the evil designs of men to bring him to that horrific death. And worse than that, you have punished him, you have laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And by his stripes, we are healed. And our Father, we want to thank you for such a healing. We want to thank you for such a great salvation. And we want to come today, this evening, to praise and honor you and to read your word and to understand more of who you are and what you are and what you've done for us and to worship you. And we pray that you will enable us to do that in a way that's pleasing to you and beneficial to us. And you'll unite us together in so doing because we pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> Our regular reading this evening is in the New Testament. We have come to Mark chapter 3. <clears throat> And in this chapter, as we heard this morning, there were lots of people in Christ's time, uh, scribes and Pharisees and others, who, who were bent on repudiating uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who were bent on proving him to be a, a fraud, a, a fake, an imposter. Uh, they were waiting to see if he would break the Sabbath day. And um, here is their Messiah who is angry with them, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, as we hear in, in verse 5. And yet there were those who, who heard him willingly. Uh, the crowd was so great that he had to, to go into a small boat. And um, despite the fact that those who hated him uh, decided they wanted to get rid of him by killing him, uh, in, in the teeth of that, in the face of that, he chooses 12 disciples. And after that, we read that he's accused of being in league with Beelzebub. And as Joe was explaining this morning, those who don't want to listen to the explanation probably weren't listening either when he explained to them that if the devil was um, going to uh, uh, compete with his own uh, forces, then his whole regime would collapse. It wasn't an easy path that Jesus trod even before the cross, was it? Another time he went into the synagogue, and a man with his shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with his shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked round at them in anger, and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all that he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions are across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Jesus went up onto a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. 
Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, his end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven him. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. This he said because they were saying, He has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. <clears throat> and we know God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, once again, a warm welcome to all who have gathered here. And I want to thank our preacher again for the, for the day, uh, Joe Flanagan, uh, our former pastor. It's always good to have a former pastor in the pew, and then, then you, you never feel bereft or uh, um, at a loss if there's a difficulty. And Andy and Sarah have been very preoccupied looking after their uh, parents who have been in hospital. And so, Joe, we do appreciate your coming today and preaching for us, and we uh, did appreciate your message this morning and look forward to hearing what the Lord will say to you, to us again through you this evening. And then on Wednesday, uh, 8 o'clock, that is our regular midweek prayer and Bible study in this case. So please come along to that if you're free. And then next Lord's Day, Billy Houston, the pastor of Mount Pottinger Baptist Church, will be along to preach morning and evening. He will be preaching the, the following Sunday as well, so two Sundays in a row. And then remember the August outreach week, that very important uh, first week in August when every single soul in the in the church and among the adherents is needed to, to keep everything going with the Holiday Bible Club and the Coaching for Christ. Uh, let's remember that continually. 13th of August, clean up day and also volleyball coaching. Uh, see Dave if you are interested in that. And then the 2nd of September, as I said this morning, is a big day for us as a church when we look forward to the induction of John McDermott as our new pastor. And uh, finally, there is a book, uh, not recommended specifically by the new pastor, but uh, recommended uh, by the elders that we might read in the wake of his coming, um, in the expectation of his coming. Uh, it's a book entitled, The Book your pastor wishes you to read, but is too embarrassed to ask. And so um, I'm not embarrassed to ask, and the books are out there. And if you haven't received one, there's one per family, so please take one. Let's come again then and uh, come to the Lord in prayer for some of these matters that we have covered in the announcements. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we can come to you and intercede uh, for those in need, for those who are unsaved, uh, for every situation that faces us, uh, and also to remind ourselves that the very breath we breathe comes from you, and without you we can do nothing. And so, our Father, we come to remember those who are ill. We think of Sarah's mother and Andy's mother, and we thank you that uh, Sarah's mother has, has shown some improvement and is, is uh, going to be able to sit up a little and that uh, Andy's mother is expected to be able to move out into um, other accommodation. And our Father, we just pray that you will continue to be with them. We thank you that they are both your children. We thank you that they uh, have their faith and dependence in you uh, beyond all the, the medical help and available uh, assistance that's there for them. We know that they're looking to you.
for their future, whatever that may hold. And we pray for Andy and Sarah and their families that you will sustain and uphold them at this time. And for those in such families who don't know you, we pray that even these trying times might be such as to bring to their thoughts and minds where they would be, were they to be faced with serious illness or even death. And so, our Father, we pray to you for Hazel's mother. Uh, we just pray that uh, she will get the treatment that she needs to alleviate her symptoms and her pain and discomfort. And you will bless that family as well. And we think of Sylvia's mother and we think also of Zelda's father. And we thank you again for Ethan, that uh, he is on the way to recovery out there in Papua New Guinea. We praise you for that. Uh, thank you for that prayer answered and for the, the blessing that is to the family out there. And we pray that you'll be with them during this remaining time until November and bring them home safely then. And our Father, we just pray then too for Paul uh, down in Yule. We, we thank you uh, that despite a serious accident, he is progressing well, we understand, and we, we pray for him that you'll continue to work a recovery in his body and that soon he'll be able to resume those duties that he so wishes to, uh, to take upon, to, upon himself. And we pray that in the meantime, this will be an opportunity for others who maybe weren't as involved to become involved uh, as has been happening, we understand. Uh, we pray for the whole family at this time too. And we think of Afaf, we know that she has a chronic condition which uh, leaves her weak and, and which causes pain and discomfort all the time. And our Father, uh, there are others like that too in our church fellowship. We just pray for all such. And our Father, we pray for, for those who have come through uh, such things. We think of Pat here who's with us. We praise you for her and for the recovery she has had. We pray that will continue. And for others, our Father, who have health concerns and needs that we maybe don't know about, we just pray that they will be able to uh, leave them at your feet and to trust you and look to you for the help that they need at this time. And our Father, we just pray then too for our church. We, we thank you for the exciting time that we have ahead of us the prospect of a new pastor coming. We praise you for the, the clear way in which you have guided uh, to bring us to that point. And we do pray for John and Rachel and each of the family, Faye and Micah and Phoebe, and we just pray that you will prepare them and bless them, that they will have a good rest, even though they have been so busy moving house and preparing in so many ways. And our Father, it is our prayer that as they come to us and as the induction service takes place in September, that we will, um, as it were, be given a new lease of life as a church, a new incentive, a new impetus to move forward together under this ministry. And our Father, we just pray then too for uh, the August outreach. We do thank you that we have the, the privilege and opportunity of, of contacting so many children. Uh, as we heard just, just now, so many wish to come to the coaching that we can't accommodate them all. Uh, our Father, this is a great blessing and a great opportunity. Uh, but our Father, it is our prayer that uh, you will help in terms of the organization, in terms of the management of all of this, that this will be an encouragement to us as a church as we work together in so doing. And our Father, we pray too then for the children who will come along, the young people who come along to the, to the Coaching for Christ. Uh, we pray that they will uh, be enthused by, by what they're doing and what they hear. But our Father, you know it is our prayer above all that they will comprehend uh, the, the, the gospel which is presented to them, that uh, as they learn about Joseph and as they hear those uh, messages uh, out in the field and in, uh, in the playing fields, we pray that uh, the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts and even prepare them now that they will uh, see their need, that they will seek the Lord and trust in him while he may be found. Our Father, we just come to you to ask your blessing upon our meeting and your blessing upon us in our future, in every way. And we do so with great confidence because we come in that all-prevailing name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. And our second hymn is, if I can find it, um, Love of God Revealed in Wonder. And we'll stand to sing. I only had to look at the screen, didn't I? And then I would have seen what it was. Uh, we stand to sing together, and then following that, Joe will come and read and preach to us.
Thank you, Derek. Uh, let's turn, please, to God's Word. Uh, we have two readings. The first is 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 14. 2 Peter 3, 1 to 14. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for far, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot, spot or blemish and at peace. And then turn, please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Matthew 25, reading from verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lumps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lumps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lumps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Must read the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again just for your word. We thank you that it has so much to say to us, even in our day and generation. And as we look into it this evening, uh, to this well-known story. We pray that you might underline those things that we know and reveal new things to us that we might indeed uh, take mind of them and may they move from our mind down to our heart and may we obey them as we walk throughout this life in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Well, I'm uh, sure you're uh, aware that we live in a society uh, that provides social security from the cradle to the grave. Uh, every one of us wants to feel secure, and more than that, we expect this as a right. That's why we pay our taxes. Over the years, things have been changing, and the onus has been delicately shifted from the government on to the individual to provide for their family's health care, their own wanted redundancy, their fast approaching retirement, and their certain death. Rightly implemented, this is a good and necessary part of being a responsible person. We indeed ought to watch out for our family and our future needs in a wise and careful way. However, being able through insurance companies, etc., to provide a secure and happy future for oneself leads as often as not to a future without reference to God. And as a result, life is built upon the false assumption that God and his purposes are irrelevant to our well-being, both for time and eternity. The idea of preparing to meet God is thought of as bizarre. The thought of waiting for the return of Jesus, while in the meantime committing our life under the direction of his lordship, is looked upon by the vast majority of people as foolishness in the extreme. That is why those men who walk with the sandwich boards over their shoulders with the message, prepare to meet your God, are the joke of modern day society. To modern day man, he's not a herald of the reality that is to come. He is in fact a religious fanatic who has nothing better to do with his time than to scare innocent people out of their wits. Jesus, however, will not be as lightly dismissed. And so the title that I have given to this evening's sermon is Prepare to Meet Your God. Before turning to the parable of the ten virgins, as it is commonly known, I believe it to be necessary that I just give you a summary of the duties of the bridesmaids at a Jewish wedding. In the days when Jesus was upon the earth, it appears that marriage generally took place at a very early age. The rabbis fixed the minimum age for marriage at 12 for girls and 13 for boys. It was customary for a bride to be surrounded by 10 bridesmaids who would be chaste young women who have never been married. Most likely, they would have been their special friends and of the same age as the bride. And these 10 bridesmaids would have been dressed in white and would have gone to the bride's home for the purpose of preparing to meet the bridegroom. These young girls in the parable should not be thought of as sitting somewhere along the road in the middle of the night, overcome by sleep, while their lumps begin to flicker from the lack of oil. It's better to see them quite busy at the home of the bride, taking care of last-minute preparations. The bridegroom with his friends would arrive at the bride's home to escort her back to his own house or to his parents' house where the wedding would take place. The ten bridesmaids would precede the wedding party with their lit lamps to illuminate the pathway and to proclaim that the wedding feast was about to begin. Now, we need to understand that these oil lamps were not the same oil lamps that would be used in the home. These lamps were, in fact, torches. They consisted of a long pole with oil-drenched rags wrapped around the top, and when lit, these torches would burn brightly. Because of this, the oil content would soon be depleted. So within 15 minutes, additional olive oil had to be poured on the rags to keep them burning. So it was imperative that the bridesmaids carry with them a little flask of oil in order to keep the torches burning brightly. Having set out the duties of the bridesmaid in their original setting, let us now turn our attention to the parable 
that Jesus told. And the purpose of this parable is, in fact, to call its hearers and its readers, in our case, to a position of preparedness to meet the Lord. It is a call to live our lives in light of eternity. Jesus is coming again. Are you prepared to meet him? The first four verses tell us that we are to be wise in our preparation. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lumps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise, for when the foolish took their lumps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lumps. The advice of these verses is, be wise in your preparations. Now, there was nothing evident in their lives or in their appearance that would have indicated that the ten bridesmaids were not prepared to meet the bridegroom. They would all have been excited at the prospect of meeting the bridegroom. They would all have been dressed the same and carried the same kind of torch. But the text reveals to us that there were five of the bridesmaids who were foolish and five who were wise. Five brought extra oil to keep their torches burning, while the other five did not. Five were prepared, five were unprepared. Well, what does this mean? Well, first to understand what it means to be wise or foolish, again, I just need to give you an overview of the bridegroom, who the bridegroom represents and who the bridesmaid represent, and what the oil signifies. Hopefully you're following me. The bridegroom. The bridegroom is a representation of the Son of Man. And the reason one can say this is because of what Jesus says in verse 13. Having related the parable, Jesus closes by saying, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The coming of the bridegroom is a picture of the coming again of Jesus. Jesus referred to himself on another occasion as being the bridegroom. To the questions why his disciples did not fast, Jesus gave this reply in Matthew 9, 15. Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. And of course, he was making reference to himself as the bridegroom. The bridesmaids. The bridesmaids are a representation of the visible church. The five wise bridesmaids are those who have made proper preparation to meet the Son of Man. The five foolish bridesmaids represent those who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, but who never really have known the reality of salvation by making Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord of their lives. The five wise are true professors of faith, while the five foolish are those who make empty professions of faith. And I would identify the foolish bridesmaids with the parable that speaks about the tares that grew up amongst the wheat. Both were allowed to grow together until the day of harvest. That brings us to the oil. The oil is the symbol of preparedness. It seems clear that the lumps represent the outward aspect of profession of Christianity. It is a representation of letting the light of Christian faith shine in this dark world of sin. The oil depicts the inward and the spiritual reality of a living faith. Of course, the question that you and I have got to ask is quite simple, yet it is of great importance. Have you and I made proper preparation to meet the Son of God? Is our profession a true profession of faith, or is it a profession that's empty of faith? The stark reality of, of it is this, that the church of Jesus Christ is full of those who profess false faith. There's nothing evident in their appearance or in their talk that would indicate that they have not made proper preparation. 
Nevertheless, the scripture tells us many will stand before the throne of God expectantly, only to hear those terrible words of condemnation, depart from me, for I never knew you. And they will offer up excuses, but it will make absolutely no difference. So I, I say to you again this evening, very graciously, and yet pointedly, are you truly saved? The Apostle Peter exhorts us to make sure in 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fall. All the bridesmaids knew the bridegroom would be coming soon, bridegroom would be coming soon, and so they gathered at the bride's home waiting for him. They did not have a schedule. They did not have a, a certain time that he would appear. They, they didn't know, so they had to wait. So they needed to wait with expectant patience, verse 5. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. Now today, it is the bride who usually keeps everyone waiting. I have known that as I have stood at the front of a church and the bridegroom and his best man uh, have been standing fidgeting and 15 minutes has passed and the bride has not arrived. And sometimes you can even see the blood draining from the groom's face. But here in the parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom was a long time in coming. It was the opposite here. It wasn't the bride, it was the bridegroom. Now we don't know what delayed him. But as a result, all the bridesmaids fall asleep. Both the wise and the foolish bridesmaid couldn't keep their eyes open. And the sleep of the foolish bridesmaids might suggest their false confidence. They thought, it's okay. Whereas the sleep of the wise bridesmaids might suggest their genuine security and, and resting in the knowledge that they had made proper preparation. But could I suggest two alternatives? Firstly, unbelievers fall into a form of deceptive sleep because the coming of the Lord seems to be taking such a long time and they begin to doubt the promises of God. The world mocks the church when she speaks about the coming again of Jesus. You keep telling us that Jesus is coming again, but where is he? Nothing has changed for thousands and thousands of years. And because the world asks a question that the church cannot give a definitive answer to, they dismiss the church as a gathering of cranks that will believe in anything. Perhaps we begin to understand how Noah felt. God told Noah that he was going to destroy the world, world by a flood because of man's sin. And Noah, being a preacher of righteousness, turned faithfully to the people that he lived amongst and repeatedly told them that God was going to literally pour out his anger upon them by destroying the world by flood. They laughed him to scorn. They thought he was a fanatic. Imagine how Noah felt over that 100, 100 year period. The only voice among many scoffers declaring that the judgment of God was soon to take place. However, when the first raindrops fell, the scoffers began to wonder if they should have listened to Noah. But how they must have cried out as the flood waters rose above their heads and they knew that the door of the ark was shut tight. Listen to this warning of Jesus found in Matthew 24, 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. 
so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. What the unbeliever fails to grasp is that a day in the sight of the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. There's no such thing as time in the eyes of the Lord. He has allowed us to have time so that day and night and minutes and hours and etc. etc. so that we can put things in a package. But with God, who is sovereign, there's no such thing as time, just eternity. Secondly, believers fall asleep because they have lost their sense of expectancy. God alone knows when Jesus will return. And according to Jesus, his coming will come quickly, and his coming will be right on time, just as his first coming. You remember what Paul said in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And for centuries, the church has looked for and longed for the second coming of Jesus, but alas, he has not come yet. In part, this explains why some Christians think very little about the second coming of Christ. While others are so taken up with the coming of Christ, they have now drawn up charts that show the prophecy, the progress of prophecy, and they even, in fact, have several speculative dates. But I believe all Christians, you and I who believe, are to wait expectantly. Could tomorrow be the day? I have no idea. Monocular Collier vision allows a horse to see different through each eye. And the way, if you ever look at a horse, there's an eye on the right and an eye on the left, and because they're not close together, they can see to the right, they can see to the left. That's monocular vision. Binocular vision, which they also have, allows a horse to focus on things with both eyes at the same time. So horses have the ability to switch between using monocular and binocular vision. In other words, they can at the same time see clearly what is on the right and the left to them, and yet in the twinkling of an eye, they can see what's coming towards them from a distance. Christians need a dual focus that will keep their eyes fixed on the tasks that we are to do here and now, while at the same time keeping our eyes fixed upon the coming again of Jesus Christ. We cannot, we dare not fall asleep on the job. Let us not grow weary of waiting on the coming of Jesus, for in due season he will come. Matthew 24, 30, 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Surely what keeps the believer going in the difficult days is this truth. We're on the winning side. The best is yet to come. We're told here in Matthew 25, verse 6, at midnight the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come to meet him. When people had nodded off and all expectancy had gone, the bridegroom appears. With the appearance of the bridegroom comes the realization that there were those amongst the bridesmaids who were not prepared to meet him. The realization of the foolish. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lumps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lumps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. They had slept in the bliss of ignorance. They now awakened to the stark reality that they were unprepared to meet the bridegroom. They requested that the other five bridesmaids 
give them some of their oil. But the wise bridesmaids quietly declined their request and directed them to go to those who sold oil and buy some for themselves. Now, there are those who would suggest that the wise bridesmaid were a little bit stingy in not sharing their oil with those who had none. Some would go as far as to say that they did not manifest the benevolence of the gospel. But let's say they had shared their oil with the foolish bridesmaid. Well, it's a certainty that very soon the wedding procession would have come to a halt because all of the torches would have gone out. You must realize there was no street lights in those days. Okay. But there's a far more important meaning in the spiritual context concerning their refusal to share their oil. Most obvious is the fact that there is only one who can supply the oil of preparedness. God is the exclusive supplier, and each person must go to him. And William Hendrickson, in his commentary, notes, preparedness is not transferable from one person to another. So, my dear unsaved friend, no one can believe the gospel for you. No one can grow in grace for you. Your father or mother's salvation cannot save you from the consequences of your sins. And the pronouncements of the church, either at birth or death, will not give you the gift of salvation. It is you and you alone who must be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you're not prepared to meet the Lord at your death or at his second coming, whichever comes first, you will not be able to blame anyone but yourself. Personal repentance of sin and faith in Jesus as the only way of salvation must come now. Life can be likened to a game of cricket you can be bold, numerous gospel overs, but when the stumps fall and the bales fly, you're out and you never get to bat again. There's no second innings. I wonder, are you prepared to meet God? Well, that brings us to the reward of the wise in verse 10. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. While the foolish five bridesmaids were away trying to buy oil for their lump, the bridegroom arrives. And you can imagine this small procession through the, the winding streets making its way toward the bridegroom's house. The five bright lights showing the way. And you can almost hear the, the cheers and the cries of delight and joy as the wedding party finally reaches the front door. And you see them going into the house one at a time, where you can be assured that inside the house there will be the wedding ceremony, and after it there will be a feast that will surpass all known feasts. It was known that Jewish, Jewish weddings lasted for about three days. These were they, they who were ready and went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. True believers, those who have repented of their sins, those who are trusting in Jesus as their Savior, those who have lived their lives under his lordship will enter in. And we are told that we will sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and the door will be shut. The door shall shut out all pain and sorrow. The door shall shut out the wicked world the tempting devil, the doubts, and the fears of life on earth. The believer may have to face trials and tribulations here and now, but the day of the Savior's coming, everything's going to change. Everything. Last but by no means least, that brings us to the ruin of the foolish in verse 11. Afterward, the other virgins, virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. The door has been shut. The foolish return, and they begin to hammer on the door and, and shout at the top of their voices, Lord, Lord, open up to us. Never will be the reply. Who are you? 
I don't know you. Most people want to escape the consequences of their sins, but they don't want to give them up. And when they get caught, they cry and say, sorry, but this is to avoid the axe coming down upon their heads. Jesus will not be fooled. Many will come at the 25th hour only to be turned away. The mistake of not preparing for that day will be irretrievable. Are you truly prepared to meet God? Have you repented of your sins? Do you truly believe in Jesus for the salvation of your soul? Are you living your life for him and him alone? For when the door shuts, you will be on the inside or you will be on the outside. And that for us is the question of question. What side will you be on, the out or the in? Listen to the warning voice of Jesus. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. <coughs> Just recently, we had a death in our family. A young man of 23 years of age. Paul was his name. I recollect the time we went to see him when he was a little baby down in the city hospital. He had a Perth syndrome. He had 50 operations throughout his life. But he was a, a young man that enjoyed life. He had two sisters that loved him, a mom and dad that cared for him. And on that Sunday night, Jane had taken him upstairs, as she normally did, put him to bed, and he said, night, night, mommy, love you, see you in the morning. Ronnie, his dad, went up the next morning, took the dog, the dog usually jumps on the bed, and Paul would throw back the clothes. But that morning, there was no movement. Paul had died at 23 years of age in his sleep. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And so I say to you, prepare to meet your God. And make sure you prepare properly. You are to prepare now, not later, when the door has been shut. Because there will be no second chance. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunities that we hear the gospel being preached. We do thank you for the very fact that oftentimes we sit in a congregation and even the Holy Spirit troubles us and we think to ourselves, I need to do something about this. And then we talk to people after the service and we go out home and we think no more about what we have heard. I pray that that would not be the case tonight. I pray that what has been said, and especially those who are unsaved, that they would have heard it loud and clear, and that before they go to sleep tonight, that they would make preparation, they would be wise, and they would call out to God through faith in Jesus Christ and be wonderfully saved. We thank you, O oh God, that there's still opportunity. We thank you that there's still that day of grace when people can come. But we do know, we do know that Jesus is coming again and people will not be able to turn to him when the door is shut. Do remember our loved ones. We all have those in our family who are not saved. We love them dearly. We have friends that we rub shoulders with, and we love them too. And so we would pray for those who would not pray for themselves. And we would ask that you would enable them to come to see their need of Christ, and that they would put their trust in him before it's too late. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a, a lovely hymn to, to close with. Um, beneath the cross of Jesus. I find a place to stand. Amen.
Father, we thank you that as we finish this day in your presence, we look forward to the week that lies before us. And we thank you that you know all the turns and the hills and the valleys that we must travel this week. And we're thankful that you have ordained what will take place. And it is so good just to be able to put our trust in you to know that you always do us good. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.